All right, we're back for another episode of The Mortgage Show. We're in the middle of a heat wave right now. It's summer season. Mortgages are kicking into full gear. How you doing? Things are going pretty good, man. I hope everybody's good out there. I'd like the I'd like the start to the summer season. Unfortunately, we have no AC in the office right now, so I'm baking a little bit. <laughs> we do not. The office is a no-go zone for me this week until that gets fixed. So what do you think, man? How, how are things going for you? Going good. Life's been crazy. As anyone that knows me knows, just like work and kids and softball and all that stuff was a little bit nutty up until last week. And fortunately, that's behind me now. And now I'm ready to enjoy the summer and, and work's been pretty good. How's the market been for you? You know, a lot of activity, a lot of people talking, a lot of offers lately. It seems like it's heating up. It's pretty nice that we have a little bit more inventory. Mm -hmm. It's also nice for a change because I think the pattern the last two years, right around this time, like there was a lot of instability in interest rates. So it's like what you were quoting one day and what two days look like, or maybe 20 minutes look like was two different things. So far, it's been like steady eddy. You know, it seems like rates are trying to push mm -hmm. down gradually. Yep. So it's like, it's like, it, it feels normal, which is nice. Yeah. It's not fun to operate in this business when you're unsure if you can quote a rate one second and if that rate's going to be true, like you said, 20 minutes later or 45 minutes later. And it's kind of funny when you say that we just got an email that pricing was suspended because there is going to be an adjustment. In this case, it's for the positive. But like, you know, there's times in the past where there'd be a bunch of midday pricing changes and that's that stuff's tough, especially when it's going the other direction. So we should get into the conversation of why is it going this way right now? You know, unlike the last couple of years, inflation is just a bear on everything when it comes to financing, not just mortgage financing, but we have some tame inflation lately. And usually what's good for interest rates is actually bad for the economy. We've had some very stale retail sales reports recently. You know, manufacturing has been down. Now, granted, like I'm not saying that the sky is falling, but these numbers are not off the charts, hot along with high inflation like we had the last two years. So it's like we finally bottomed out a little bit. And we're now in that area where it's nice to be a loan officer because interest rates are actually going the opposite way for once, which is down. So. Yep. And I have some borrowers that, this might be education for some people, but I have some borrowers that are under contract. And right now we're 44 days out from closing or 43 days out from closing. And we're at the point where we're actually not locking the rate in. We're going to wait till they get within the 30 day window, see what pricing's like. For those that don't know, pricing's better the shorter amount of time that you lock a rate for. So, for example, a 60 day rate lock is more expensive than a 45 day rate lock, which is more expensive than a 30 day rate lock. So, anyways, in a flat market, it's okay to wait till you get to a shorter period of time so you get the best pricing. So, anyways, I have a few people that are doing that. And it's been nice to operate in this flat environment and not be like petrified that rates are going to freaking go through the moon one day just for no reason. You know, it's nice and it's it's been a habit of mine ever since I got in the mortgage industry, but Randy's just not like throwing darts and saying, hey, let's float your interest rate. Let's try to get within these certain lock periods because pricing gets better. It's like, you know, we've got this website that shows us the minute by minute trading of mortgage backed securities. It advises us to float or lock. And again, with stale economic news or less than economic news, it's it's advisable right now to float until something crazy happens. I mean, there's always things that could happen unexpectedly. There's no doubt about that. But I mean, looking at the guidance, we got we got emails daily from our boy Scott Hanley, and in there says that there's nothing that's going to drive the market between now and I think it's August second when there's the Federal Reserve meeting and then July jobs report. So if there's nothing like that on the schedule, the really the only thing that could move the market is something unexpected, which again is always possible. But it's good for us to be aware of when reports are coming out and we can kind of plan accordingly. So it's pretty nice, man. And so it looks like in that Fed meeting, it's it's pretty unanimous right now that they're going to lower prime. So that's not the mortgage rate. That's the interbanking lending rate. So if Randy's a bank and I'm a bank, it's the suggested interest rate that we should lend to each other that yeah. we would then turn around and put a margin on lending it out to people. But what it does for mortgage rates, I mean, when the cost of borrowing or when prime lowers, lowers interest rates, it's it's a good thing for us. It's no. The cost of borrowing money needs to go down. We need to spur some economic activity. And I think we're in that area. I know I'm regurgitating the same thought multiple times, but it's like we're finally in this area right now where I feel like borrowers 
affordability might go up a little bit because rates are coming yep. down. It seems like we have a little bit more inventory, so it's putting some, you know, some pressure south on on listing prices. Um, mm -hmm. You know, talk about that. What, how do you feel about that? You're noticing it, price reductions. We're seeing it everywhere. Yeah, we're seeing price reductions. We're seeing houses sit on the market longer. It's definitely creating some opportunities for the buyers that I'm working with, which is nice. You know, last summer was probably one of the more challenging summers of my business personally. It just seemed like nothing could get under contract. And then the numbers at the end of the year reflected that. But it does seem like people are able to put stuff under contract now. And it's very encouraging. So, so uh, go ahead, finish that thought. I was just going to say, like, I with this talk about rates going down and, and home homes becoming more affordable as prices go, uh, as interest rates go down, I do think it does create this opportunity for demand to increase as we go into the fall though. And that is something that's kind of like a double-edged sword with the people that we're working with, because it's like, it's like, do you want to wait for rates to go down to buy only to compete with that many more people? Applications are inversely, correlated with interest rates rates go down applications across the country go up so it's you know we could see ourselves in this situation in the fall where it's a whole hell of a lot more competitive because rates have come down and people are coming out of the woodwork only to drive prices back up so i'm not saying it's a good idea to make a stupid decision and overpay for something now but like i would have comfort buying in this market right now being able to get into a house and then i'm sure we've talked about it before but cmg offers the rate rebound program where if we do a loan for someone now and rates improve in six months from now, we can refinance them. No lender closing costs, you know, origination fees, appraisal, credit report, all that stuff waived, plus a thousand dollar credit towards third party fees. Like I think that should help people feel comfortable knowing that they can buy now, even if the rate is a half a percent higher than they want it to be, knowing that they'll just basically refinance for free in six months from now. All good, all good stuff, Randy. And, and I think with our refinance program, the trick of the trade back in the day was as the interest rates are coming out, it's, it's easier to give a borrower a quarter higher interest rate, which had more profitability, which you would turn around and then add to closing costs. Our, our refinance does not act like that. It's a cut commission. It's a cut. It's a, it's, a, I mean, CMG cuts their margin. We're yeah. giving, you know, those fees for free. So it's like, it's going to be very, hard for us to lose that refinance in a competitive refinance market just because yep. of the way we handle that. That's I'm huge excited. that you pointed that out. One of my borrowers, I was asking about that. I mean, or was, I was telling them about rate rebound and they were like, well, do you just turn around and increase the rates and kind of bake it into the rates? And I'm like, no, we cut our commission. I'm like, I don't know anyone else that does it quite like that. And I'm yeah. happy to cut my commission. If I can get a second, do, do a second loan for someone, help them get their first loan with comfort and plus minimize fees that they pay. <laughs> It's a great program. It's a great program. And, you know, I want to piggyback some of your thoughts on inventory borrowers and stuff. I think what this market is starting to do, too, is like uh, maybe money's drying up a little bit. We don't see as much cash in the market. We, we still see cash, full <laughs> disclosure. But you're going to start seeing or different types of financing are going to come. It's going to come back. You're going to be more apt to want to accept a VA loan, an RD loan you know, maybe something a little bit more riskier from the seller's standpoint. But I mean, if you're working with professionals like us, man, I mean, guys that just get loans done, we know our guidelines, you know, we can put those loans through. So I'm excited for those type of borrowers. You know, we have some down payment assistant loans, you know, with FHA, those become mm -hmm. more in play. So I think that's great. You know, mm -hmm. we just, we're going to be able to use more tools now. So I hope so, man. We, we both built our business on helping people like that. And yes, prices have changed a lot. But I hope that there's a world, you know, at some point where those people can get into homes that have the need for down payment assistance or our veterans and stuff like that stuff's been people have been shying away from that stuff over the past few years. So it'd be nice to have it come back. So rates down, inventory up, organically, more borrowers, mm -hmm. hopefully a better, better end to the year. I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah, man. totally. Yeah. So one of the things that we want to talk about. Because, I mean, every every month that we do this, it's like, I want to talk a little bit about the market, but we also want to talk about things that we've, we're learning about CMG or the industry, things that borrowers that might listen to this might benefit from, referral partners that might listen to this might benefit from. And I have a couple transactions going like this, and I know you do too, or, or recently did, but been doing more and more mobile homes, and in particular, single-wide mobile homes, right? Have you just closed one not that long ago? Yeah, and, and here's a big distinction that we need to get out of the way. 
manufactured equals mobile, modular equals stick built inside of a factory. So mm-hmm. for some reason, those two get mixed up a lot. Manufacturing equals mobile. So yeah, um, mobile and uh, modular and manufactured are not the same thing. Yeah. So, but but I've been doing a lot of manufactured homes. I have a lot of people that are interested in them. Some go under contract, some don't. Yep. So I'm at this point where I have a couple closing this month, and and it's been a good learning because it's not it hasn't been a part of my business in throughout my career. And I don't know about you, but like single wide mobile homes, no way. You know what I mean? People would typically stay away from those, but the prices in this competitive market have really attracted some people to them. And mind if I just share a couple things? Man, hammer hammer away. Yeah, and we can talk about some of the more unique aspects, but like you can finance a single wide mobile home with conventional financing or FHA financing or any of those things. We couldn't necessarily do that at Norcom. And I don't know the exact mechanics behind it, but like since we've come to CMG, it's kind of opened up the the floodgates for that type of thing. So anyways, with conventional financing, you can go as little as 5% down and FHA 3.5% down. One thing that I'm learning that we probably need with these single wide mobile homes, so if you're a realtor listening to this, is that we're probably going to need a structural engineer's report. There are scenarios that we don't need that, but a couple that we do is if there's been any additions to the single wide mobile home, which the ones that I'm working with right now both had additions to them. I think yours had an addition as well. Yep. Right. And then also for me, the appraiser noted that the structure wasn't tied down to the foundation. You know, so having a mobile home, like those need to be t- tied down to the foundation and that it wasn't. So like we need the structural engineer's report to go in there and either confirm those things are true or not and or then fix them afterwards. So anyways, if you're doing a single wide mobile home, outside of a unicorn situation, I'd probably plan on getting a structural engineer's report and it costs anywhere from 600 to a thousand bucks. Now, are you suggest? and this is an interesting, so is it from the seller standpoint, you would suggest them getting that before they market their property or are they, or are they going to look at it as a listing where I realize I need this and the buyer coming in needs to pay for it. I, I don't know. I could go either way. It's a leverage thing, obviously, but it's like, it's, it's a just a, thing. it's a matter of how proactive the seller wants to be. I mean, I would love it if sellers more proactive. And I feel this way about condos all the time. Sellers never identify if their condo is even suitable for conventional financing. Should they do that? Yeah, absolutely. They should do that ahead of time. A lot of times they wait to see if a buyer's financing and then just kind of pray that it comes back. I kind of see it this same way with this structural engineer's report. Yeah. If someone comes in and buys these places cash, then it doesn't even matter. But if someone's coming in with a loan financing, whether or not you are borrowing 25% or 95% of that purchase price, like, and if you have additions or something to indicate that the structure is not tied down to the foundation, you're probably going to need one of those. So anyways, this uh, my advice to people moving forward. And we've been okay with this. I mean, we probably waited 10 days to order it. Like I would just order it day one. Yeah. Personally. There are a couple of things that kind of bring this back to a simplistic area. So these things have HUD tags. There's a date in 76 in which they're supposed to have an identifier on them. If yeah. they have that identifier, single wide or double wide, on its own land, on its own foundation, we could offer conventional financing 5% down. We could offer FHA financing 3.5% down. It's getting a little dicey because we had some portfolio options and it seems like the portfolio option pulled back on some of the park scenarios. We were able to do single wides, double wides and parks on lease land, which was a pretty nice option. So it seems like the market's been a little gun shy on that lately. So I don't yeah. know. Parks don't are know. tough. Um, one thing that I noticed, Randy, and it's on the same topic, is like I had one approach me from 1978, single wide on its own land, and like the conventional guidelines and FHA guidelines don't let you cash out refinance on a on a single wide. We have an alternate A program that actually allows you to do it. It's it's so crazy, and you said this talking to me recently, and I know that you've been talking to your referral partners. It's very hard for us to say no to a transaction. We have something for everybody. Should we bring up the fact that, so just a couple hours prior to taping this, we had a company meeting. The owner Yeah, bring this up. It's good. Yeah, this is, I mean, the company, we're going to buy a bank. Yeah. Can I set the stage real quick? Set the the stage. Let's do this. Because it actually gave me kind of flashbacks to a few months ago at Norcom because all of a sudden yesterday there was this email that we got that said that we're having an all hands on deck meeting with Chris George. And it said something about like a market update, I think is maybe what it was. But part of me was like, that's weird. We haven't had any, you know, 
quotation market update since we've been here and it's been almost three months now. So like, what is this all about? I missed the call today. You missed it. We had, we had things already planned as we often do, but like come to find out Chris George founder and CEO of uh, CMG is buying a bank, which is freaking awesome. So that's a no big deal move. That's, <laughs> that's a guy with a couple bucks in his pocket. That's a guy looking to it, the major function of this is, well, it's twofold. When, when a company like ours funds a loan, we're borrowing money to fund that loan. And that money costs money. So that, that, that is part of, you know, any business that you run is a gross profit margin. It affects interest rates. If we become a bank now, we are using our own money to fund purchase loans. So at the end of the day, it's going to make us more competitive with interest rates, which I think we are already super competitive. I actually think our rates are fantastic. Like I have no hesitation about quoting anything like no big deal. No big deal. So then, so then you cut out some margin of having to borrow money to lend out money. Now our interest rates get better. And number two, now you're going to be able to offer some in-house portfolio financing. So like our license here at CMG, we're allowed to partner with local banks and use their portfolio products. It's a nice little referral relationship that we have, but yep. now we're going to have our own bank and we're going to have our own portfolio options. So it might be filling some of these gaps for these, for these random things, going back to like single wides on, in, a, in a park, you know, yeah. that's something that's now in play where we're going to fund it with our own money. So definitely going to create some opportunity for us. You know, pretty good news, man. I've worked at two places in the past prior to CMG where conversations came up like if things happen in the market or this or that happened you know the owner is just going to buy a bank did not happen in either situation but yeah. here we are three months into cmg and like the owner actually buys a bank there's no doubt that it's going to benefit our customers it's just one of those things where we're going to kind of see how that happens over the next four to six months if not longer i'm sure there'll be a lot of changes but it's just going to allow us to offer more which is one of the great things about cmg so far is just how much we can offer chris george doing chris george things no big deal Friend of the podcast. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> Friend of the podcast. <laughs> just, uh, hey, just just two poor kid, poor Biddeford kids interviewing a guy out in California, huh? Worth $100 million. No, no big deal. deal. <laughs> so, and I'm just guessing on that. I have no idea how much worth he's, he's the man. So I'm, I'm happy for that. So that's good news today. So what else you got, Bits? We have an interview coming up, but I mean, is there anything else you want to share before we get to that part? Yeah, so... I know we're talking about business. So Randy and I cross paths pretty regularly. Randy's got a busy schedule. I've got a busy schedule, but there's there's a lens that I view Randy's life from that I want you guys to know about if you don't know already. My kid is out of school. She's in college. She doesn't play sports anymore. I see that smile coming on his face. You guys should have seen this run that the Bitterford Girls Little League Softball just had. Randy Forcier's kids on it, a bunch of friends of ours' kids on it. Give, give give some of that, Randy. Let them know. Because, I, dude, I think you're a really good father. You're a really good husband. You're a good son. You know, all of that stuff. You're a great business partner. Talk about that for a minute. Well, thanks, buddy. Yeah, the the past couple months of life have just been so insane with softball. For I have three daughters, and all three of them play softball. But my oldest daughter is 11, and she's on the majors all-star team. And they're really good. You know, they have a lot of great 12-year-olds, great 11-year-olds. And they've had success since she's been in All-Stars for the past few years. Anyways, so we are we were into All-Star season and we won our district tournament, which means we beat, you know, five, six, seven other teams from York County, went up to the state tournament in Rockland, spent all week there. It was a blast. We won a bunch of games and we ended up losing on the very last game of the state championship game against Gorham, lost two to one. And it was just such a good run because we played these the same team two years ago in a similar state tournament and they 10 run ruled us two times. So we beat them once this past tournament, we came within one run. So it's like to see the growth of our girls, my daughter specifically in the past two years is freaking awesome. And they made memories that they'll never forget. Like I personally made memories as a father that I'll never forget. So it was just an awesome run altogether. Too bad it ended, but like it was a great couple months. And now, you know, as of July 17th, 18th, I kind of have my summer back, which is cool. Which is nice. And I think, I think it's cool that you share that and I, when you and I were talking about it. I just think the the area where you can, you know, talk to Aubrey and talk to the girls of like, do you remember when, whenever they're having like a bad day, you could bring back these memories to them and just tell them, all right, it's it's time to step up here. Let's let's move mm -hmm. on from this. You're better than this. You got this. Remember when you did this. I think that was a moment for you. 
can I tell you something about that? Because like we had this conversation and it really stuck with me. And I told the same thing to Aubrey. And now we're going down to like a parent corner kind of thing before we bring our guest on. But you said this thing about Haley where she had a big moment in sports and you told her like, or you didn't tell her, but you try to remind her anytime she's having a tough day or something isn't going the way she wants. Like, remember that moment in that game. And I said the same thing to Aubrey because she she had some very clutch moments in these past couple of games where I'm sure she was stressed. I know how she gets her stomach gets upset and she's very nervous. And I'm like, just remember that, like next time you're in a game and you're nervous like that or you're in life and you have a job interview or something like that, just like know that you have what it takes to get it done and come through. So it was awesome. And I actually thank you for, for giving me that thought too because it's an awesome thought. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. And congrats, congrats on a great run and, and sharing that. Yeah, dude. So anyways, that was fun. Do you want to talk about our guests for a second? Yeah, so we always go down this rabbit hole of who we're going to have on. And I was like, you know what? I've been, I've been doing a lot with credit lately, so I reached out to Birchwood Credit Services. We're going to have a girl on here that's got over 20 years of experience. We're going to talk about a couple things, you know, what a good credit borrower looks like, the opposite. We'll talk about some things with trigger leads. So I'm, I'm excited to dive into this with her. So hope, absolutely, hope you guys enjoy it. Her name is Samantha Markwood. She's the Chief Operating Officer of Birchwood. Birchwood is a company that is like integral to our business. Again, we get our credit reports from them since I've been in business, probably since you've been in business, we've ordered credit reports through Birchwood at a yeah. number of different companies. They're actually based out of North Conway. Um, and, you know, I will say Birchwood is one of those companies that whenever you call them, whoever you get on the phone is always very nice, which goes a long way. You're not talking to someone from out of the country. Like if you need help on a credit report that you just pulled, you have a question, like there is always someone helpful at Birchwood willing to help. So I'm happy to have her on. I just think it's important so, whenever you have a partner that their ability to respond right away is mm -hmm. like no big deal to them. And that's how they are. You already said it. And I, I've always been impressed by that. So yeah. cool. Yeah. All right. So let's bring on Samantha. All right. Let's do it. We're here with Samantha Markwood, the COO of Birchwood Credit. Sam, thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me today. I'm excited to join. It's funny because we've been working with Birchwood for, I mean, Bets, how long have you been doing this? 20 something years. I've been doing it 16. It's always been Birchwood that we've worked with, but I don't know that I've ever like face to face with someone from Birchwood. It's always just a, someone, whoever I call into the office in North Conway. So it's nice to put a face to the company. Well, awesome. Yes, we absolutely appreciate our partnership with you guys. So I, again, am excited to be here and part of this conversation today. So thank you. How long have you been at Birchwood for? I've been with Birchwood about a year and a half. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Larry Avery, who is our CEO, has been with the company for many, many years, brought me over. But I have been in the industry for quite some time. Uh, <laughs> was with Factual Data for a majority of my career and then on to another CRA. And then here I am at, at Birchwood Credit and they are just amazing folks. It's a great organization. And I get the opportunity to work with folks like you every day. So it's you know, wonderful. So I think of Birchwood solely as the company that we use to get credit reports. In the past, we would do rapid rescores and things like that. And I wouldn't mind getting to that at some point. But like, how would you describe Birchwood's full level of services to companies like ours? Yeah, no, that's I thank you for that question. So obviously, <laughs> as you guys know, but for everyone else, Birchwood Credit Services is a CRA. We partner with banks, credit unions, brokers who ultimately provide that tri-merge credit report for those applicants who are applying for a mortgage, refinance, et cetera. So we offer that credit report along with additional ancillary products to go along with the, the loan cross and other services as well. So as far as some of those services, one of them would be like that rescore scenario that yeah. like, you guys do a lot of those still beds. Do you do Re, uh, rescores ever? I never ever do rescores. It used to be a thing that we used to do all the time where someone's credit is just below where we needed to, but if they do this, 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 and this, we'll rush things being updated and we'll get a rescore. Are you seeing a lot of those, Sam, still? Yeah, we do still see pretty significant volume pertaining to rescores. It, it ultimately depends on the timeline that you're working with that consumer because, you know, I have other clients who We'll kind of coach and educate their their applicants and, you know, reviewing that credit report, that that profile and kind of giving some tips, if you will. And there are products out there that kind of help guide, 
you as the lender and also the applicant to say, you know, if you do X, Y, and Z, you've got potential to see a, see a score increase here. Um, but I am noticing that, you know, some of our lender partners are, they've got some time. Um, so they'll coach and work with the borrower and they'll wait that 30 day period, we'll say 30 days for that information to update naturally versus kind of the rescore is almost like an expedited process. It's like, hey, you know, Bureau, whether it's TransUnion, Equifax, TransUnion, my applicant has paid off their Capital One credit card. So can you update your records quickly? Um, Some of them are more receptive to that than others, right? It, it, it never seemed like a sure thing to me back in the day. And I don't know if that's changed or beds what your experience was. It would be like, sometimes it'd be like, okay, TransUnion's not going to update right away, but this this Bureau will. I'm just like, this seems too stressful for not even like a 100% sure thing that'll even work. You know, you asked me, and it's been a while, quite a while since I've done one. Last time I did one, so basically it's, Anything that's erroneous on credit or anything being adjusted, the creditor needs to provide a letter on their letterhead, right? With the account number in, in the body of the letter, the reflection of whatever it needs to be changed. That's the <laughs> format, right? And then it goes to all three credit bureaus for what's, what is the turn time? So is the process still the same? And what's the turn time for the credit scores to adjust? Yeah, so you're right. In today's environment, we don't necessarily always need that letter the bureaus will accept in in most circumstances a statement as long as it has you know the the creditor name account number et cetera et cetera which we can share that detail with you but it's a it's a three to five day business turn time is what we typically quote to get that resource submitted in and sent back um, mm -hmm. so 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 Randy that's actually kind of a pretty cool thing for us because if we have a file drop on our lap that needs to close quickly, but it's like a marginal borrower and it's sort of not working with another lender. Maybe we take a look at it and decide if we could fix X, Y, and Z, get a rapid rescore, all of a sudden, you know, we're the hero in the process. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Better better credit scores equal better pricing and makes things a whole heck of a lot yeah. easier. And I think, you know, even if you don't do a rescore, just in general, you know, if it's a profile that might fit that need and you have opportunity to have those conversations, I always think it's, you know, such a great opportunity learning experience for that consumer while you're talking to them. You know, if you're going to do the rescore, you know, make sure they understand, hey, this is what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. In the interim, don't go out and charge up your credit cards. Don't miss a payment. Don't, you know, transfer the balance from this card to this card, those things may have a negative impact on what you're trying to do. But I've noticed, you know, a lot of our, our lender partners are trying to utilize that time to educate while they're trying to assist that, that consumer. Yeah. When you talk about late payments, don't do anything like that in the meantime. I, it makes me think of the number of transactions that I've had fall apart or be negatively impacted yeah. on borrowers missing like a $40 Kohl's card payment or something like that. It's incredible. And you probably don't see the credit scores you know, as much as some of the people that handle the phone calls when we make them. But it's incredible to see borrowers that just like a $40 payment slips their mind and their credit tanks from 740 to 680 and it's thousands of dollars difference in interest. Oh yeah, that that missed payment or having that derogatory mark on your credit report has a significant impact on your credit mm -hmm. score. So it's very important to to always make your payments on time, mm -hmm. even at forty dollar payments. <laughs> that's the worst part. Like I, it, yeah. it's something about that like forty fifty dollar payment, and you know you don't even. I think some of these places don't allow you to do automatic payments and then they hope that people miss and they can collect their fees or whatever. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm conspiracy <laughs> theorizing, but like. You know, it's just like those easy ones that you can't set and forget. And the next thing you know, it just derails people's ability to get a mortgage or really affects their pricing. But maybe you can speak to this. A lot of times people ask me like, oh, hey, I, you know, I, you know, I forgot to pay my payment or the the bank didn't pay it or whatever happened. I'm just going to get a letter. Can you take that off my credit report? Can, like, do, do you ever get that question? Have you heard of people? Like, I know that it's not as easy as that. Like a yeah. creditor might reverse a late fee because of whatever story you have, but like, it's hard to get a creditor to reverse an actual late payment on a credit report, right? Yeah, I guess it depends on the circumstance. I mean, if a consumer saying, hey, I missed this payment, like, oh, oh no, and it's a few days late, 
And I'm talking 30 day late payments. I should, okay. I should specify, like, I want to get rid of this 30 day late payment that shows up on my credit report, but it's because of an error on their own part. There's really no scenario that a creditor is going to actually remove that, right? Yes and no. It depends okay. again on the circumstance, but it wouldn't be something necessarily that you could help, right? You yeah. could guide them and say, here are your options. You know, that applicant can work directly with the creditor depending upon the length of, you know, the service they've been with that, that creditor, they may help them okay. uh, or they can reach out to those, the three national credit bureaus and dispute that and provide any evidence they have that, you know, Hey, I made this payment or it was a bank error or whatever it is to help kind of investigate that if you will, and go from there. But it's typically a, a dispute process. It's kind of funny when people dispute things, it's, you know, like it's ultimately the borrower's fault. I feel like most of the time they might, they might have a story as to why it's not their fault, but like it really like is, you know, most of the time. And they, you know, in, in my experience, they haven't had a whole lot of luck removing those. So, you know, okay. what I noticed is that borrowers don't realize on the credit side of things, a lot of times with our accounts, we have a grace period. Then there's a late period after that. Mm -hmm. It actually doesn't affect your credit score until you are 30 days late. Right. Mm -hmm. Randy just touched upon that. So this is like a big thing. I have people that are like a day late on a credit card and they're freaking out. It's like, no, it is actually 30 days. And yep. I recall earlier in my career, so within year one to five, I'm on year 21. I went to this credit seminar. I think it was Equifax and this. This guy with probably the best presentation I've ever seen. He's in the middle of explaining what a most recent credit late looks like to the credit scores. And he throws up his two hands and he screams. And that speaker was a nice system in that room. It was really loud and piercing. And his point for screaming was, and you could speak to this, Sam, is like a most recent late is the worst case scenario on anybody's credit score. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it impacts significantly that, that credit profile. And even to Randy's earlier point, you know, even that, that $40 payment, you, you've got to, you've got to be responsible. You've got to understand your, your entire credit profile and when your payments are due, because that can have a negative impact. And then of course, you know, ultimately could be the deciding factor on, on how your loan moves forward. Mm -hmm. And if you even qualify. So Chris and I were talking a little bit about what makes like a really good credit profile and what, what's more of like a lower end credit profile. And I know you're probably not hands on with individual credit reports, but are there like general tips that Birchwood gives out to people like that we could pass along to borrowers that might listen to this, things that are important, things that we might not realize that we should be telling our borrowers? Yeah, I think a lot of it is pretty, I don't want to say common sense, but mm -hmm. it, it basically is. But I think that, you know, Birchwood does not typically give out any advice when it comes yeah. to this and this for your credit. But being in the industry for so long and having the opportunity to work in various roles throughout my career, I've seen a lot. So yeah. I think it's extremely important for consumers, one, to understand their credit profile first. Like you should be checking in regularly um, on one of the free sites, looking at your credit report, knowing what's on there, monitoring that credit, right? But aside from that, I say common sense is pay your bills on time. <laughs> is that easy? That's really all you have to do? Yeah. You, gotta, you gotta pay your bills on time. And you made a comment earlier, but hopefully my sister doesn't watch this. I won't say her name, but you know, she <laughs> she's a busy lady and we were talking not too long ago and she missed a payment. Now it was a few days and she's like, oh my goodness, same thing. She was freaking out because she has perfect credit. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're fine. Just pay the, make the payment. I said, unfortunately it was on a credit card. They might up your uh, interest rate. Interest rate but yeah. Nonetheless, <laughs> just pay it. But we started talking about setting up automated payments. And I'm like, why don't you just auto enroll in everything that you can and for it to come out? Now that works for some people, but a lot of us, myself included, because I spend too much, some people work paycheck to paycheck and they can't really, you know, they don't necessarily know if on the 15th of every month, am I going to have X amount of dollars available to pay off a full balance, yeah. to pay off a full balance. Right. So, but anyways, obviously, you know, managing that and being responsible and making sure that you are making your, your monthly payments on time with every creditor, regardless of the amount that has a significant impact. 
of course, you know, a lot of people talk about the the revolving credit and the impact that has on your credit profile too. <laughs> Again, guilty. Um, you know, the norm is, and what they say is to keep that credit utilization around 30% or under 30% to kind of maintain a, a good score. Now, you know, kids birthdays come up you know big 10 birthday and you're charging everything it's just <laughs> trying to maintain and be cautious of your credit utilization and your spending and staying within you know your means so to speak so you can stay on top of it every month um, and when you can't of course go above making that minimum payment yeah. if you can pay more pay more you don't necessarily need to have and it's not actually always good to bring your revolving debts down to zero every single month. Maintaining and building that good credit history will actually help build your credit score. Totally. Which is, which kind of touches on something I tell people a lot. It's like, I'm going to pay off my credit cards to improve my score. But it's like, the one thing you don't want to do is pay them off and close them, you know, because yeah. you lose, you lose that history that's associated with that account. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. It's, I just had this conversation not too long ago. There was like, I don't know, a few a few credit cards, but they had been open for years and years and years. And they use them here and there. They've got small balances. Same thing. They wanted to pay them all off and just close them just to get them off their credit report. And I'm like, listen, I'm like, I wouldn't recommend it. I'm like, keep paying, make the payments. And because your credit history, you've had these open for 10 plus years. You've got mm -hmm. all this beautiful payment history that you've established over that that time frame that has helped build your credit profile today. So you're right. It's not always a smart move to to close those good standing accounts out. I have, a, yeah. I have a story of a client that refinanced and interest rates within six months went down again. It was a 760 credit borrower. And when I looked at the accounts, when I looked at the credit six months later, they were 640. And what it was is one of the, I think the wife saw a report that said close accounts that you're not using. So she closed all of her husband's accounts, left accounts that had under two years of history. They mm. weren't late. So that, that gave me like an up close idea of like, oh my God, if you remove 30 years of credit history, <laughs> now he's going to build a little bit more time yeah. with these new accounts, sort of proving to the credit bureaus. You know, I know how to use credit. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I think also, you know, when you talk about building that, that good credit profile, it's, it's having a good mix of like a di diverse credit report, if you will, you know, not just all revolving or not just, you know, a mortgage it's having, you know, a few revolving your car loan, like your installment, your, your mortgage. Um, and it's just yeah. naturally being consistent, being responsible with those payments, you know, we might talk about this a little bit if we get into, you know, negative impacts, but you know, everyone, when you hear inquiry, you're like, eh. um, Oh yeah. People don't want an inquiry on their credit. So no one wants an inquiry, <laughs> which yes, inquiries can have a negative impact on your score. If you've got some excessive inquiries, right. But one thing I like to mention, and of course it's going to, I'm going to draw a blank as I'm talking through it, but you know, when you're shopping for a mortgage, there there is a time frame in which you can go out and shop for a mortgage. And, you know, maybe you're going to bank A, bank B, bank C. If you're shopping, I'm going to say 14 days, but that could be wrong. So yeah, so, I feel like I've heard conflicting things on too, and I should know this better. Yeah, maybe I can fine, <laughs> fine tune it afterwards. I've heard 30 days, I've heard a couple of weeks, you know, like, yeah. but you do have a window to look and what, what yeah. is important about this window? Because I think you're going to get to it. Yeah. So if you're shopping, right, and, and you've got a few lenders pulling your credit report, as long as it's for that same perm permissible purpose within that time frame, which we will find out, you you will only get really dinged for one inquiry. Although you'll see them, it, won't, it will only have the effect of one yeah. uh, while you're shopping for that loan. We only tell people that when we're the second people pulling their credit. <laughs> Not the first. But yeah, no. <laughs> so that's, that is good to know. It's important for people to know. People are very protective about the inquiries. So like definitely want to be able to have those conversations and give them the right advice. So we'll fine tune, fine tune that period of time. But thanks for mentioning it. There's two more things I want to mention before we let you go. Cause I really do appreciate your time. Of course. Um, the first one is 
the cost of credit reports. And this isn't like a negative thing coming from me, but they've gone up a lot over the past, whatever, five, 10 years. I mean, they used to be what beds like 30 bucks a pull or 40 bucks. And now they're like 80 or they might even be more than that now. But can you speak to what, I mean, no one's complaining specifically about them, but like, I've just seen them go up. Why is that? It's not necessarily a Birchwood thing. Is it an Equifax TransUnion Experian thing or? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's across the board, right? It's an industry. You, do you talk back to when I first started um, in mm -hmm. the industry, you know, credit report was, I don't know, $15 for a tri merge. And now to your point, right? It's what, 75 bucks. Yeah. I'm just throwing a number out there. But it's for multiple factors, right? You've got the bureaus who are increasing costs for data. You've got FICO who's increasing the cost of data. Um, and then, of course, you know, your resellers who are compacting that tri-merge credit report to ship out to their to their lender partners. So it, it's across the board. And it's, I mean, it's hard to say when it levels out, but it has gone up quite a bit and it just kind of is what it is but it's not like it's not like birchwood's higher or lower than anyone else it's just the market the market for credit reports has gone up and it's just kind of yeah. is what it is and they're obviously a certain uh, a very important part of a transaction so it just kind of kind of is yeah what it is yeah. and I, I think you know what's important too is because every although we're all in the business right i think we don't all function the same and this is why you know i typically bring in my team of experts to to kind of analyze you know how is CMG functioning today? How What does your workflow look like? Let's look at this together from a pricing perspective to see what makes the most sense. Because pricing, yeah, it, it, it changes and can change and can make more sense for you versus, you know, ABC Bank, just depending upon how you do business. Okay, thanks for sharing that. The last thing I wanted to ask you about was trigger leads. And I don't know if there's anything you can speak to those. And that's basically like we pull someone's credit report and then... Next thing you know, they get a call from ABC lender because that lender found out we pulled their credit for a mortgage. And like, how does that work? And what's Birchwood's involvement? I mean, it's just the nature of the business. But like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on it are it's <laughs> overwhelming for the consumer, yeah. right? And yeah. and even for the lender, because then you've got your consumer calling back in and saying, hey, I've got 15 calls saying they can do this, this, and this. So what happens, you know, you pull that hard credit report and then that information is shared from the national bureaus, not Birchwood, but shared, <laughs> <laughs> like not Birchwood, shared to some of those lenders for a firm offer of credit, right? So now you've pulled, so now the bureaus are like, okay, Sally Smith is looking for a mortgage. Here you go. Pool of people. Yeah. Have at it. You know, you could, there are pros and cons to it, absolutely, but I'm going to speak specifically to myself as I sat in, in the consumer seat, which we're all consumers, but you know, I, I refinanced, you know, a while back and I'm in the business and I know how to opt out, which I'll talk about in a moment, but literally it's, I'm talking 30 to 50 calls, emails, texts a day. And it, it is, it's overwhelming. And I think I don't want to get too off topic, but you know, I think that's why naturally, you know, our industry is, is shifting a little bit more towards that, that soft inquiry up front. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got time to kind of work with that consumer, educate them too. And this is what I've been working with a lot of our lender partners on is, is sharing that opt out um, information with them, because I think it's important, like, hey, borrower, you know, I have pulled your credit report, it's a soft credit report, although you'll be able to see the inquiry, because they can still yeah. see the inquiry. It's yep. a soft inquiry. It doesn't impact your credit. No one's going to be calling you for, you know, 50 calls a day for, for additional credit uh, offerings. But in that time period, you know, you can provide, I think it's optoutprescreen.com. And I can send that to you guys too. So you have If you it. think of it, that would be super helpful. Absolutely. But yeah, I, I, I'll send that over. But, but the website, you can go right online and opt out, I think. If I remember correctly, if you opt out online, I think it's a five year time frame where you can opt out. Um, there is a there is a way to opt out um, forever. Um, <laughs> that has to be that has to be, I think, uh, a written request, which instructions are on that website on how to do that. But, you know, I, I've been trying to more and more just educate um, the lender partners that I work with. And saying, hey, listen, it it, we're, it looks like as an industry, we're shifting more towards this soft pool. 
as these loan officers are working with the consumer, the borrower, share this information, say, here's what's happening. Because we do, we get calls from consumers all the time about, you know, we sold their data, it's been a leak. And I get it because I, I, I lived through it myself and I'm like, this is insane. So I will share that information with you all. And so you have it and, and can share that with your, with your borrowers and consumers as well. That'd be super helpful. I used to think, as you could probably echo this too, like I used to think, okay, I'll just leave their phone number and email address out of the software. So <laughs> if I run their credit, they're not going to have that information. Yeah. But then someone reminded me that like, there's so much data out there that, you know, they can match people's names to their email addresses and sell, you know, and still get that information. So, so just doing that is not enough to shield your borrowers it's from getting. Not. Yeah, yeah, it's not. I had, I've had a handful of folks I've worked with who swear that it does work. But no, that's leaving that information out. They'll still they'll still get the data. Because to your point, it's it's coming directly from the national bureaus, and they already have that data. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, listen, Beds, are you good? Is there anything else you want to ask Sam? I think she just dominated, dominated, crushed it. So I wanted to say thank you so much for coming on. We value working with Birchwood. I was telling Beds before we got you on. Birch is one of those companies. Whenever we call, doesn't matter who we get, doesn't ever seem like the same person twice, but. <laughs> But they're always very nice and very helpful to us in a time that we're probably frustrated with something that we're even calling. So thank you guys Aww. so much for everything that you do. No, thank you guys. Like I said, we value our partnership so much. And I appreciate those kind words about the organization. We mm -hmm. absolutely have probably the best team I've worked with in my career. So I'm thankful for that. Awesome. Yeah. This was fun. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate you coming on. We'll be in touch. All right, back from the interview. What do you think? We did some good stuff today, man. I like talking about the market. I like credit stuff. I think that that was very valuable and I hope everybody listening enjoyed it. I mean, it's not too fun of a topic, but these are things that we need to talk about it. So yeah. credit's a big part of getting a mortgage, you know, and sometimes we encounter those borrowers that have that 800 perfect credit score, but a lot more times we encounter people that are in the low sevens or the mid sixes, low sixes. I mean, I've run people's credit that their score was in the upper 400s, which was you know, it happens. So, so, so that we can explain things and help them guide them to better credit. I think that stuff's very important. So agree, man. Thank you uh, to those that are listening. We appreciate, appreciate you guys support. We're three months in at CMG. Let us know what we can do to help whether you're a borrower or referral partner, someone just listening, keep us in mind for all your mortgage needs.